glad to see you here all this morning. It's a beautiful morning. We're going to be doing some songs this morning for you, and if you know it, please sing along.
Thanks for singing. You may be seated. Good morning. Welcome to Smithfield Christian Church, where we love like Jesus. I am so glad to be here worshiping with you guys today. Um, it has been a uh, busy, busy week for our family um, with spring break and all the things. And to come back today and um, it, I just, I feel so grounded here, you know, um, with you guys and with um God's here. God's presence is here. And um, and so I just feel God's presence here. And I'm so glad to be worshiping with you guys this morning. Um, I'm so glad um, to see some new faces as well. If you did not get... Sorry. I had, a, I had a hair on my lip. Um, if you did not get a gift from us, we would love to give you a gift. You can stop at the table in the foyer on your way out. Um, and just a little something for us to tell you that we are glad that you are here worshiping with us this morning. Um, a couple announcements for you. We have a children's volunteer um, meeting on April 16th from 6 to 7 p.m. This is for anybody that volunteers in the children's ministry. Um, a lot of things have been going on and happening and stuff, and so we want to make sure everybody's on the same page. So um, if you have not let me know um, that you are coming to that, please let me know, um, especially if you need child care for some reason. And we will make sure that that is available for you. Um, but we will keep it to one hour, I promise. Um, I won't talk too long. And Joe, Joe's going to be doing a lot of the talking, so he won't talk for too long. Um, so, um, and then next we have um, texting. If you are not on our texting list um, this is a great way for you to be connected throughout the week. Uh, please, you can text this number, SEC text to the the word SEC text to the number 84576 um, and text that now even and this is not for us to spam you with text we are not going to be spamming you every day sending you all kinds of things it's going to be a max of like two maybe three texts a week um, but this is a great opportunity for you to stay connected um, with any important updates that we have, um, prayer requests that come up throughout the week. And then also sometimes there might be some devotions or some resources from the sermon um, from that previous Sunday that Joe will send out. And so it's just a really great opportunity for you to be connected in that way if you are not already. So uh, make sure you text that number. And then um, if you would like to worship through giving, we offer um, a few different ways that are on the screen. They're also listed in your bulletin, so you can check that out um, as well. And then if you would pray with me, and we will continue our service. God, I thank you for another day for us to get together um, and worship you. I thank you that we can come here together, that we can come into your presence, God. And um, I just thank you for all the things that you do, all the ways that um, you show your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness to us, God. Um, I thank you that um, we're starting a new series about um, Christ-likeness, and I thank you that we can we can strive to be like Jesus. Um, that's something that we really try to do, God, and I thank you for all the ways that you um, give us that opportunity and um, for all the ways you let us start over when we mess up as well. God, I pray um, that you are glorified in this service. I pray that you are the center of everything that we do this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church.
Praise God. Break every strong 
Well, I tell you, every week that I do this, it gets harder and harder to follow that. <laughs> Those guys, thank you, Dan. Thank you, praise team. You guys rock. <laughs> and thank you, God. <laughs> but um, this is uh, kind of a bittersweet day for me. This is going to be my last communion devotion that I do here. Uh, Janice and I are going to be moving away, and uh, I will truly miss this. But um, last week was incredible. The service was great, but the reason for the service was greater. Um, Jesus died and was buried, and a week ago today he rose from the dead. That is the best news that anybody on planet Earth has ever heard or ever will hear. So, um, we do communion every week. Anybody that believes in Jesus can partake of Holy Communion. Now, for those of you who are here, um, the communion elements are in the chairs in front of you. Those that are worshiping with us online, um, you can use whatever you have handy, or you could come to the church during the week, and we'd be glad to give you whatever you need. I like to um, have us take communion the way the, the disciples did, where we do it together. And it's just, to me, it's, it's more of a blessing that way. And I hope that y'all would find your elements and kind of get things ready to go so when the time comes, we're ready. Um, but Jesus told us at the Passover meal that his body was going to become the bread and that his blood would be the new covenant. 1 Corinthians 11.25 said that we should do this as often as we drink it. This is such a great way to honor and worship a God for the gift that he gave us that cost him everything. And we need to remember that. I, I, for the longest time, when we went to a church and we took communion often and people would tend to just take it for granted and just, oh, it's just another thing to do in the service. And what I like about SCC is that there's folks like me, and I really appreciate everyone that is in this rotation because it makes it special to me. It reminds me of why we're doing it. And it doesn't just become something to do on Sunday morning. John 3.16 said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. What kind of love must that be? Now, Joe's going to be talking about how to live a Christ-like life. And I can't help but think that when Jesus said that we need to love our neighbor as ourselves and love God with all our heart, might, our mind, soul, and strength, that love is the key. Can you imagine what it would be like if we all loved one another, nobody got mad? Amen. I was looking at 1 Corinthians 13, and it says, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hope, always perseveres. Love never fails. God's Word never fails. And that's written in God's Word. 
if we were to be obedient to God's word, how much better would this place be? I'm so grateful for what God has done for us. And uh, I want us to never, ever forget that gift. You know, my sons, I love them dearly. I would give up my life for my sons. And I wouldn't even think about it. And that must be what God is like with us. But my sons have grown up to be very similar to their old man. I got one that's in the military like I was. I've got another one who works in healthcare like I did. And they, they want to kind of be like me. Well, why don't we want to be like our father? He is the perfect example that we should follow. And if we did a better job of that, if we got into his word, and if we spent time in prayer with him to get to know him, we would become more like him. And uh, I don't want to preach. I don't want to steal Joe's thunder. Um, but I, I don't want to get off topic either. But at the same time, um, I just, every time it comes to this, it just reminds me of how much God truly loves me. And it doesn't matter how bad my day is, how bad my week is. That knowledge right there is enough to make me feel better. Now, in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 and 28, it says that whosoever eats and drinks this in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. So let each of us take a moment and ask the Lord to forgive our sins that we do not eat and drink of these elements in an unworthy manner. What I'd like to do is just to give us a moment of silence so that each of us can ask the Lord to forgive us so that we may not take, partake of this in an unworthy manner. And then I'll pray and we'll partake of the elements together. Our Father and our God, we just come before you today with such grateful hearts for the great gift that you have given to us. And Lord, we want to honor you. We want to honor your son, Jesus, by remembering that gift and take these elements together. For I received from the Lord what was also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Well, this is a great, great time because when Jesus died on the cross, the curtain, the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, which gives us direct access to the throne room of God. And we can bring our praises to him. 
We can bring our requests to him. And that's what we're going to do here this morning. I've got one humongous praise. It says, congratulations to Colette Streaks and the celebration of her wedding yesterday. <laughs> I love those. Um, this one, Richard and uh, Mara Cirillo. Mara lost her father two months ago and just lost her mother two days ago. Let's pray for that family uh, for strength during this really, really sad time. And then I've got a, a card that I would like to read. It's from uh, Billy. It says, SCC family, I wish I could thank each and every one of you individual for all the love and support I've received. It's amazing to belong to such an amazing family. The prayers and good wishes warmed my heart. So many have gone out of their way to help me, and I'm grateful. This could not be said again. Any, other, any better. Your thoughtfulness is appreciated. Billy Harrison. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we just come before you. Uh, we are just grateful that we have this opportunity to bring our requests and our praise to you. Lord, we're just grateful for Colette and her now husband, and we just pray that you would be with that couple, that you would bless that union and uh, just continue to help them to grow together as a couple. Lord, we want to lift up Richard and Mara to you. And this is a really, really difficult time. And I just pray that you would give them strength, that you give them peace, and uh, just help them, Lord, as they recover from this really difficult time together. And we lift up Billy to you. It's great to see him here today and recovering very well. You pray that you would uh, continue to be with him and help him on this road to full recovery. Lord, there are many unspoken requests here that we haven't gotten in, in the basket back there. And we pray, Father God, that you would just meet each of those needs for you know what needs to be done. And we just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. In 2006, back, or in the, at the Cannes Film Festival, there was a Swedish man by the name of Felix Greslin, and he actually bore a striking resemblance to the Hollywood actor Leonardo DiCaprio, and he looked so much like DiCaprio that he unintentionally found himself being mobbed by fans uh, who wanted autographs and wanted pictures with him, and so, um, funny enough, Felix just kind of went with it, and he took pictures with fans and signed autographs as DiCaprio, um, and the thing was is that the media kind of caught wind of what was going on, and I mean, obviously, the media is like, well, DiCaprio over here and here's this other guy. What's So they kind of saw this and they kind of did a report about it. And the crazy thing was that he kind of became an overnight sensation of looking like Leonardo DiCaprio. But I think the ironic thing about this whole situation for him was that just a couple years before this situation happened, Leonardo DiCaprio starred in a film called Catch Me If You Can, where he played a con artist who pretended to be a pilot, um, a teacher, um, a doctor, and even a lawyer. Um, and he actually had the whole thing happen to him unintentionally there at the Cannes Fil Can Films Festival. Well, this phenomenon is called a doppelganger. And maybe you've experienced this before where you find a person that just bears a strong and striking resemblance where you would almost swear that these people are twins. And maybe you've even like found your own doppelganger, the person that looks just like, just like you. Maybe you were at an event or at um, a restaurant or a store or whatever, and that person walks in the door and you're kind of like struggling. You're like, 
is that so-and-so? You know, is that them? Maybe even like wave, I've done it where you like wave at them and it's like, oh, that's not them. Hey, hey, over there. Okay. What's up? You know, it's like, or you call out their name and they don't look at, I had it happen uh, a few weeks ago uh, at, at the coffee shop. I walked in and I was saying this person's name that I thought it was over and over again. And they weren't looking up at me. And then I realized it's because it's not them. Um, when I was in high school, I worked at a Winn-Dixie as a stockman, high school and also in college some. And uh, I'll never forget uh, my, uh, my, my manager, the store manager there. He had a twin brother, but I didn't know he had a twin brother until one day his twin brother walked into the store who he was also a manager of another Winn-Dixie uh, there in York County. And um, that he was wearing his own Winn-Dixie management uniform that was slightly different than my manager. And I was kind of like thrown off because all of a sudden my manager was at one in the store, but then he just walked into the, to the front of the store, and I was kind of really confused and then learned in that moment that that was his twin brother. You know, we can have those moments where we see these people that look so similar, and sometimes they are twins, and other times maybe they're, they're not at all. Well, we as Christians, we have been called to be imitators of Christ, to look like Jesus. Now, maybe not, not physically look like Jesus. You know, we truly don't know what Jesus uh, looked like. We have no pictures of, of him. We can only assume kind of, kind, of, kind of what he looked like based on where he lived there in the Middle East. Most likely, he looked like people who live in the Middle East. But, and, and so our goal is not so much to try and look physically like Jesus, but instead our goal, our intentions as Christians is to take on his character, to live, and as we say around here, to love like Jesus. And today we're going to start this brand new series that we're going to be looking at it for three weeks of what this means to live in Christ-likeness. And my hope is that over these few weeks is that we can kind of get a little bit of a picture of what Jesus was all about, who he is, and then for us to kind of especially next week, take some time and, and understand what it means to be like Jesus, to live like Jesus, and to follow in his footsteps. Because if you remember, a couple months ago when we were studying the book of Galatians, we saw this in Galatians 3.26. It says, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. You see, if you are a Christian, then you should look like Christ. When people look at you, that's who they should see. They should see Christ. In fact, the whole reason that we are called Christians, you may or may not know this, we didn't begin to call ourselves Christians. It was called of the followers of Jesus Christ that they were Christians. And in fact, some, you know, like theologians or commentators, they kind of argue whether or not it was meant to be a derogatory term, like look at those Christians over there. They're so much like that Christ. Or if it was meant to be like a real term of like, wow, those those people are just like that Jesus Christ guy, and they begin to call them Christians. We see in Acts eleven twenty five, 25, it says this, Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Now, there's a whole lot more to that um, than just those two verses of this whole thing of how they were following. You know, after Jesus uh, ascends back to the Father after his death and his resurrection, he sends back to his followers. And these, these Christ followers, these disciples of Jesus, begin to, you know, fan out and spread out and go throughout different places. And as they're doing this, they are living in such a way and treating people in such a way that people began to look at them and they called them Christians. They looked at them and they said, man, they're just like that Christ guy. And when we look at ourselves today, or we think about ourselves today, and we think about maybe within our context today, what do we reflect? Both collectively as a church, but also individually as Christians, what do we really reflect? You know, you could probably think of different things that stereotypical people would say um, about the church and what the church is all about. Some people, when they look at the church, maybe they think of tradition, they think of all the things that are done every single week and have been done for centuries and generations and all that stuff. Other people, maybe they look at the church and they think of love and service. You know, it's really interesting because generations ago, centuries ago, the churches were the ones that started up things like hospitals and they were the, because they wanted to serve and meet the needs of people. But then there's even some people, when they look, then they look at the church, they think of Christians, they, they think of judgmental people and they think of people that are hypocritical and want to, you know, want to say one thing and live another way. Well, taking 
on Christ likeness, really, the place that we have to start if we want to be like Christ is we have to get a good picture of what Jesus was like. And so there are so many different characteristics and so many different qualities of Jesus. It's important that we kind of do our best to try and look at some of those. And in fact, we actually last year, we spent nine weeks looking at different qualities and different characteristics of Jesus. And so we're not going to do the same thing with that. But today, my hope is for us to kind of almost uh, summarize or boil those, those different characteristics down into what I think are three of the most important characteristics or qualities of Jesus for us to really get a picture of him as we start into trying to be like Christ. So I want to give you three pictures of Christ this morning. The first one is his humility. His humility. You know, there is an, there's this important doctrine or theology within the church when it comes to us understanding Jesus and who he is and what he's all about. And it's actually called his duality. It's the idea that Jesus is God, that Jesus even said of himself, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That was in John 14, 9. Jesus even said, the Father and I are one. That's in John 10, 30. But along with the fact that Jesus is God, Jesus was also fully human. You kind of have these two uh, kind of aspects and two characteristics of this. I mean, the fact that Jesus died on the cross showed that he was human, that he took on this humanity. And so it's wild to kind of think about, and the truth is, we're never going to be able to fully grasp all that that means and never going to be able to fully explain all that that means, that the fact that Jesus is a human, but Jesus, or Jesus was a human, but Jesus is also God, and God is also God. And, you know, we can kind of begin to spiral out of control there of our minds trying to grasp all of that. And the fact that not only is he the fact that he is God, but the fact also that he decided to come to earth and the way he even came to earth and the manner that he came, he didn't come in a way that maybe a lot of us would have come if we had the power and ability. He comes to earth as a baby. He comes to earth not only as a baby, but born in a manger. And you think to yourself maybe for a second of what you would do if you had what Jesus has, the effect that of being God too, all of the power and the ability that comes along with that. Maybe you think of like certain situations, maybe they pop to mind of things that you would set right, some wrongs you would stop, some things that you would set in the right way, the ways that you would maybe get rid of all the bad things in your own life and get rid of all these troubles that you go through and stuff like that. And it's interesting because a lot of times when we begin to think about what would it be like to have have that power and that ability, we oftentimes think about all the stuff that we would do for ourselves and all the ways that we would maximize that power. But the amazing thing is that we look to Jesus, we look at the example that we see of him, and Paul actually talking about Jesus and using him as an example of the way that we relate to other people, he says this about Jesus in Philippians 2, 5. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, or instead, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So Jesus, God with flesh on, could have used this power and this ability and his authority in any way he possibly wanted, but what did he do? He didn't. He stepped to the side of that, didn't use it for himself. He humbled himself. And there's a couple ways that he showed his humility. First of all, he demonstrated through serving, through serving. One of the, I think one of the, the disciples' favorite pastime was arguing about who was the most important. Because there's a couple of different times that this happens where they begin to argue with each other about which one of them within the group is more important than the other. You know, like who's going to be the lead, who's going to sit where at the table, who's going to sit where in heaven and all this different stuff. And we see one situation like this in Luke 22 in verse 24. It says, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Jesus said to them, like, what I think Jesus should have said to them is probably different than what Jesus actually said to them. But what Jesus said to them was the king of the Gentiles lorded over them and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not like, you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest or the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? 
is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you, but I am among you as one who serves. What Jesus is saying is that in my state and with my authority and my ability and who I am, I still come to you as a servant. I mean, you even think about the night that he was arrested. You know, we just celebrated Easter last week and the night that Jesus is going to go out to the garden and be arrested and put on trial and then be sent to be crucified. The night that he is arrested, what does Jesus do? with his disciples. I mean, again, you think about, and I even love it how in John's gospel, the record there, and it talks about all these different things that Jesus knows. He knows what's about to happen. He knows that, the, that, that Judas is going to betray him. He knows all these different things that he's eventually going to be going back to his father very soon. He knows all this stuff. And I think about what I would do or what we would do in that moment of knowing these things. What does Jesus do though? I mean, he doesn't like devise a plan of like, okay, look, I know they're coming to arrest me, but what we're going to do instead is this and how we're going to thwart this plan and get around this. No, he doesn't do that. He also doesn't say, well, the end is near. You know, let's party it up tonight. It's the Passover meal. Let's just hang out here and eat and drink and, until we're merry and just kind of spend our time here. No, in that moment there, before Jesus heads off to be put on trial and killed for us, what does he do? He serves he serves his disciples. He washes their feet. He even washes the feet of Judas, the one who would betray him. Because that's just who Jesus is, this humble servant. But when was the last time we washed somebody's feet? Now, maybe not literally. I don't mean that literally of you washing somebody's feet but maybe figuratively. You know, foot washing for them was very common in that day. You'd go to someone's house, and as a guest, either, either a servant of that house or someone from the family there would wash your feet, would clean up your feet because of the walking and the sandals and smelly feet and all that dirt and stuff like that. They would do that as a way of welcoming you in. But that's not what we do in our homes anymore. And so I often have thought about what would be today's equivalent of washing someone's feet. And, and really, whatever we come up with, the point is not even the specific act. The point is just how we are serving. And I have to, you know, wonder for you, for me, for us, when was the last time we served in this manner? When was the last time we served our spouse? When was the last time we served our children? When was the last time we served our parents? When was the last time you served your coworkers or your classmates or your neighbors or complete strangers? Jesus displays his humility through his service. But even ultimately, after even that specific situation of serving, ultimately, do you remember what Paul said that, that Jesus did as a way to show his humility? He said eventually he did it through his death on the cross. Because again, he, he is God, and all that comes along with that, the power, the authority, the dominion, and Jesus then kind of sets that to the side, and he demonstrates his humility through his sacrifice. He demonstrates it through his sacrifice. Jesus even hanging there on the cross. And, and I can't imagine the pain and the struggle that he went through in that moment. It was said that people would oftentimes die of asphyxiation there on the cross because they struggled to breathe and the pain it took to even get a breath. And Jesus is there in that painful moment. And what happens? People start gathering around. They start mocking him. They start making fun of him. Matthew 27, 42, it says, he saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified him with him also heaped insults on him. And in that moment of pain, in that moment of being mocked, Jesus shows restraint and humility. And he actually even forgives the people that are there physically killing him and putting him to death. But how often, you know, like for us, how often we're driving down the road and like someone cuts us off and we're like, you know, or even not even cutting us off. We just get behind someone that's going like, heaven forbid, the speed limit. And we're like, you know, what's your deal? And we're like, we're ready to rain down fire and brimstone on this person because they're not going five over or whatever it might be. Or, or maybe worse, like maybe something significant actually happens. Maybe a person actually hurts us physically or emotionally or relationally? And, and how do we feel in that moment where sometimes we feel like we need to retaliate and we want to make them hurt in the same way that we've been hurt? But Jesus, he shows us his example of humility in his sacrifice. And, and why did he do this? Because he had to? No, because he chose it for us. 
And so often the sacrifices that we're called to make are so, so measly, and they pale in comparison to the sacrifice of Jesus. Maybe the sacrifice we're called to is just to go and sit with a friend and be with a friend who's hurting. Or maybe it's the call to help out physically or even financially with a person who's going through a rough moment. But if we feel like, sometimes we feel like, well, that's just too much to ask, and I can't do that, and that's too much of a burden to bear. But if we want to follow Jesus, if we want to live in Christ-likeness, then we're going to have to find some ways to humble ourselves. The second picture of Jesus I want us to see is not only his humility, but also his integrity, Jesus's integrity. I read an article from a Biola University professor. It said this about integrity. It says, the integrity is the essential distinctive for a follower of Christ. Our character defines, proclaims, and demonstrates our faith in a holy God to all around us. A kind of Christianity that defends the right theology at the expense of a life of integrity is false and represents personal interests, but not the God of the Bible. There are no shortcuts or excuses. Our behavior always declares more eloquently who we really are and what we really believe beyond any doctrinal statements that we affirm. I mean, man, when I read that, it was a punch to the gut. What this means is that our life and our, and our beliefs, they've got they've to like, they've come together. They've got to line up. And for so many of the religious leaders in Jesus's days, those things did not match up at all. You know, he saw them, how they would like call people to one standard and they would expect things out of these different people and they would do nothing to help them out. And many times, even sometimes the standards that they would call other people to, they wouldn't even live up to. We see in uh, Matthew 23, 27, it says, this is Jesus speaking, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. Jesus says, look, you, you put on a good show on the outside. You get yourself all fancied up and look real nice on the outside, and you put on a good show for everybody, but you are just full of junk and death and everything unclean. You see, friends, our lives need to match our faith. They've got to match up. They've got to go together. But what about you? I mean, when you think about your life and your faith, do they, do they match up? Are you, are you like, you know, one person here when you're with your Christian friends and your church family, and then the moment you step out of here, hop in your car, or you're at work tomorrow, or at school tomorrow, or with your family, are you a different person? If your friends and family who don't come to this church, if they were to show up here and see you worshiping in the way you're worshiping, or studying in the way you're studying, or fellowshipping in the way you fellowship, would they be like, who, who are you? Like, I don't know this person at all. Does your life differ? Do they line up together? You see, the other part of Jesus' integrity was not only the fact that our life and our faith have to line up, but also the fact that he didn't compromise on his truth. One of the things that I love the most about Jesus is his patience, and especially his patience with people. Sometimes we don't have a lot of patience with people, at least for me. Don't have a lot of patience with people sometimes, and it's something that I really should work on. But Jesus especially had patience for people who failed. When people would fall flat on their face, Jesus would have compassion on them and would have patience with them, like, like us. But what Jesus often did not have patience for was for those people who would want to take God's word and twist it and use it as a weapon and use it to hurt people. They wanted to take God's word of the Old Testament. They would want to twist it around to fit their narrative or their ideals. And so often they would use it, like I said, as a weapon to hurt people. But that wasn't what Jesus was going to have. You see, truth and love have to work together. And we, saw that, we see that exemplified in Jesus's character. There are some people that would say that love and compassion and truth, well, you know, you can't mix the two together. But I think Jesus demonstrates it so perfectly in his life and ministry. There was a powerful moment uh, between Jesus and this woman that uh, some religious leaders wanted to use as a pawn to try and catch Jesus and kind of trip him up. And so they find this woman uh, committing adultery is what they tell Jesus, and they drag her before Jesus. And they're like, well, Jesus, you know, the Old Testament law says if we find a person like this, that they have to be stoned. What do you say? What do you think we should do with her? And Jesus, you know, in his wisdom, 
In that moment, it says this, it says at, in, in John 8 and 9, it says this, at this, those who begin to hear this, or I'm sorry, let me back up. Jesus says to them, look, if anybody wants to throw the first stone, you go for it. And then in verse 9, at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked the woman, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. I think this moment right here of love and of help, and Jesus does this in truth, meaning that he doesn't compromise one for the other. He doesn't compromise truth just so he can like tenderly minister to her, but he also doesn't compromise love and mercy and gloss over the fact of her living in sin. And look, I know that there's like this, this feeling a lot of times that we have of almost walking this tightrope, especially nowadays where we kind of have to teeter back and forth depending on the group of people we're with or the situation or the circumstance we're in, where we feel like on one side we have to have a lot of love, but maybe not a lot of truth. And on the other side, it's like, well, I'm going to have a lot of truth here, but not a lot of love. But the fact is that that's not who Jesus was. He brought them together. And so many times Jesus perfectly exemplified what it meant to have truth, but also to have love. Another time, Jesus encountered this woman at the well where he, he brought to the light the truth about her marital issues and her relationships that she struggled with. But he did it not only with truth, he did it in love. Or when Zacchaeus, the tax collector who was despised by his fellow Jews, when he wanted to kind of like sneakily catch a, a glimpse of Jesus coming by. No, Jesus said, hey, I, I want you to come. I want to hang out with you today because I want you to see truth lived out and honesty lived out in me. Or even when Peter, when he starts to, to mouth off and even try to correct and rebuke Jesus, Jesus sternly tells him and sternly corrects him and, and sets him right, but he does it in a restoring manner. You see, the two have got to go together, love and truth. And Jesus so perfectly in his integrity shows that. But I think the last quality, and Bob kind of alluded to this a little bit in his communion devotion, that we cannot look over is the quality of love, the picture of love that Jesus had. Now, of course, that word love, it's kind of a, it's kind of a catch-all many times, right, of how we use the word love nowadays. We use it in a lot of different manners that maybe we don't necessarily mean the same way that Jesus loved. We say we love all kinds of foods, right? There's all different kinds of, oh, I love that. Oh, I love that. Let me try it. I love that. I, want to, I don't know if I love that. I mean, let me try it out. Or we love our team. I don't know how many of you love your team after like your bracket's been busted over the past couple weeks. Maybe you don't love your team anymore. Sometimes we love our possessions and the things that we have that maybe we've worked so long to get or we've had for so long. We love these things. But the love that Jesus demonstrates far outweighs any kind of love for food or sports teams or possessions. And Jesus' love goes beyond any kind of love that we might typically share. You see, because many times our, our, the love that we experience is almost like an easy love. The love that we default towards is, an, is a, a love that's, that, that's, that's like convenient for us. But that's not what Jesus did. He loved, in fact, in some pretty difficult ways. It, it makes me think of Mother Teresa and the stories that I, I've heard about her and her ministry. In so many ways, she became synonymous with love and service. I read about one situation in 1982, during the height of the Lebanese Civil War, Mother Teresa and her missionaries of charity began to, they decided to open a hospital in downtown Beirut. And it, the whole point of it was to just care for the sick and the dying and the needy, regardless of religion, regardless of ethnicity. And this, this decision was a profound expression of Jesus's love for people, and it demonstrated a commitment to serving those in need, even amidst the chaos and the violence of war. And despite the dangers that maybe she and her, her other uh, nuns that they faced because of the conflict that was going on, they were committed and they courageously ventured out into the heart of Beirut where they, were, they would encounter widespread suffering and devastation and need. And they provided medical care, and food, and shelter to countless individuals, all because they knew that they needed to demonstrate the love of Jesus. That's the kind of love 
that Christ demonstrates that we need to be called to as well. Amen. And there's, something, there's actually kind of two ways I think that Jesus really shows love in a great way that maybe we often don't, that maybe we should strive towards. The first way is what I would call a close compassion, a close compassion. You see, a lot of times when we hear about people in need or in pain or going through struggles and stuff, what's, what's the Christian response? I'll pray for you. And, and so often we say that as sort of like a way of like checking the box and making you be like, okay, yeah, I heard you. I know you're struggling. I'll pray for you. And let alone the fact of whether or not you actually then go and pray for that person. So often that's not really even what happens. We even forget to pray for them. But instead of just saying, hey, I'll pray for you, what if instead we found a way to come close to them and to be with them in that moment of hardship and share with them in that pain? It's one of my favorite pictures of Jesus. Um, Jesus is with his disciples. He gets word for that, from, from some people that his friend Lazarus is sick and is going to probably die. And by, by the time they finally decide to go and to, to be where they are, Lazarus dies. And when they get there, Lazarus' sisters are grief-stricken, and he kind of encounters them one by one. And both of them in different times come to Jesus and said, Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If only you had been here. They are in this, this pain and this turmoil, and they're suffering because they feel like they were let down, and they're also going through the heartache of losing their brother. And, and the thing that I love so much about this is that Jesus— Instead of like swooping in and fixing it, because we know he does that, right? He calls Lazarus out of the grave, brings him back to the, to the, from the dead, and that's awesome. But before he swoops in and fixes the situation, what does Jesus do? He steps into their pain and he shares in their hurt. And we see in John eleven thirty five, 35, it says, Jesus wept. He's there with the sisters and he's standing before this tomb where their brother is buried, where Jesus' friend is buried. And instead of just snapping his fingers and making it all better, he shares in that pain and he weeps. When was the last time that you just sat with someone and wept with them? When was the last time that you shared in someone's pain instead of feeling like you had to fix their pain or fix their problem? When was the last time you had that kind of compassion? You know, the Bible tells us that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And one of the ways that God does that is, through being, is, is by being close to us in these times of need and times of struggle. And we need to do the same thing to be close to people in that. But the other way I think that maybe we don't do such a great job of showing the kind of love that Jesus does, but a picture that we see a demonstration of his love was the way that he had a desire to forgive, a desire to forgive. And when I first wrote this, when I was working on this sermon and I first wrote that out, I actually wrote a willingness to forgive. But then something kind of struck me about that word willingness, because I think Jesus has a lot more than just a willingness to forgive. Because when you're just willing to forgive, it's like, yeah, I guess I'll do that. Sure, I'll, I'll go along with that. But that's not what Jesus was about. Jesus is even more than just a willingness to forgive. And he's got a desire to, get, to forgive. Do you get the difference there? You see, a willingness is like willing to just kind of go along with it and these different things like that. But, you know, maybe we, we don't like the situation. Maybe we don't want to be a part of the situation, but sure, we'll forgive, I guess. You know, maybe I feel convicted at some point. Maybe I, I hear a sermon or I read a scripture and it's like, okay, sure, God, I'll forgive. I'm willing to do that. But instead, instead of reluctantly forgiving, that, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the way that Jesus sought out to forgive. And sometimes we need to do that same thing. Not wait till it's easy, not wait till it's convenient, not wait till they come to us and beg for forgiveness, but instead for us to seek out the opportunity to forgive. It makes me think of the way that Jesus calls us in such a great way, a very heavy way to forgive. We see it in Matthew 6, 14. He says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. And Jesus, like he didn't just go with the flow with the forgiveness. No, he went after people. He sought them out. We see it in Peter. You know, Peter, at the crucifixion of Jesus, Peter goes off and he is kind of trying to hide out of fear of what may happen to him. 
and people are like, hey, weren't, weren't you with that guy, Jesus? And he's like, no, 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 I don't know him. And he denies knowing Jesus, even calling down curses and, and trying to, you know, distance himself so much as possible from Jesus. In this moment of Jesus being alone and being killed for him, Peter's like, no, I don't know the guy, and is running away from that. And Jesus, after he comes back from the grave, you know, it wasn't like, oh, well, when Peter comes to me and asks for forgiveness, sure, I'll forgive him. No, no, no. Jesus went looking for Peter and found him out fishing and in that moment restores him. Or I even think about Paul and how Paul, for so many of his years, um, of it, when he became a Pharisee, that he thought he was doing right by bringing down the church of Jesus. He thought that Jesus wasn't the Son of God, and he persecuted the church, arresting Christians, even having some of them put to death. And again, Jesus wasn't like, well, we'll wait till Paul finally wises up and recognizes what he should do, and then we're going to forgive him. No, he went and sought him out. And as Paul is traveling to Damascus, Jesus confronts him and he restores him, and not only restores him, uses him to do incredible things. You see, D Jesus didn't just give in to forgiveness because he had to. It's like, well, he's Jesus, right? He's got to forgive. No, 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 that's not at all. He went looking for this. And the thing is, friends, is that that's the kind of character, that's the kind of forgiveness that we are called to if we're going to step into this thing of Christ-likeness. We need to pursue forgiveness. These characteristics, these characteristics of humility, of integrity, of love, I think in so many ways, these, are, these sum up who the character of Jesus really is all about. And I hope that you, you can look at these, these characteristics and you can look at these ideas. And even in next week, when we talk about how to follow after Jesus, I hope you can see how you can find practical ways in your own life to walk and to live in Christ likeness. It makes me think about, I came across this, uh, this video of one of my favorite preachers and authors, Francis Chan, and he was talking about how um, at his church that he, he was leading, that he had this guy come in and speak. It was a guest speaker talking, you know, kind of preached for him one week, and, and in, the, in the middle of his sermon, he started talking about this guy who had this profound effect on his walk with the Lord by the name of Vaughn, and he was like, Vaughn, you know, not, not this Vaughn over here, don't worry. Um, he's like, you know, Vaughn was this to me, and Vaughn did this, and he kind of, you know, showed this, and he just impacted me in a powerful way, and he said the next week, I had another guy come in and was speaking about this ministry organization, and he talked about his own testimony, and he was like, when I was in youth group, we had this youth leader named Vaughn, and Vaughn did this, and Vaughn impressed him off upon me like this, and it was just so amazing, these things, and, and it was crazy. He said, the third week, I had this other guy preaching, and he didn't talk about Vaughn. He said, but afterwards, I was telling these two guys, or I was telling, telling him about these two guys the week before who got up and were just talking and talking about how great this guy Vaughn was, and, and the different, you know, Christ-like attitudes this guy Vaughn had. And that he said, the third guy was like, oh, I know Vaughn. Yeah, I know him. And he began to talk about how Vaughn would oftentimes, who lived in, he lived in San Diego, California, and he would take people down into Tijuana, Mexico. And he wouldn't take them to like the resort areas. He would go into the slums. He would go into the places that were dangerous. And in the ways that he would go and he would seek out people in need and he would minister to these people and how he would do his best to try and love these people. And Francis Chan said, the, the thing that really struck him about this third guy who was talking about Vaughn was he said, he said, you know, whenever I was around Vaughn, it felt like he said, I would think to myself, if I could walk around with Jesus throughout my life and throughout my day, it's like walking around with Vaughn. He said, Vaughn was so much like Jesus in his character and his love for people. He said, I was like, I was walking around with Jesus. And, and Francis Chan said for him in that moment, he kind of began to think, would anybody say that about me? And I want us to stop and think about that for ourselves. Would anybody say that about you or I? That like, you know, when I hang out with Joe, it's like I'm walking around with Jesus. Not like, you know, that we're perfect, but that we are striving to try and love people. We're striving in our integrity. We're striving in our humility to try and be people like Christ. Friends, none of us are perfect. None of us are sinless. None of us can go through life like Jesus. None of us can do the things like Jesus, but we can do our best to walk in Christ's likeness. We are called not just to wear the name Christ or Christians, but to truly walk like Jesus, to strive to be like Jesus, that when 
people get around us and they hang out with us that maybe they, they refer to us like the, the, the people in Antioch did when they saw the disciples. They called them Christians and they say of us, man, you must be a Christian. I can just tell by the way you love people, by your integrity, by your humility. And I hope that's the kind of lifestyle that you seek out. Father, I, I pray for us that you would you would help us to have that kind of character, the character of Jesus. God, so often I, I feel like maybe we want to just kind of add Jesus on to the rest of who we are or the rest of our life, or we want to just add Jesus on to the things we do or the things that we strive for. Like I'm going to build myself up and I'm also going to have a little bit of Jesus, but God, may we die to that. May we truly crucify that old self and embrace Christ-likeness. And Father, I pray that, that when we interact with people, that it's not about impressing them with how holy we are, but that they can feel your presence through us. That the way that we love people, the integrity that we have, even the humility we display with people, that people begin to notice you in us. And God, I know it's not easy. I know that sometimes we can feel kind of overwhelmed by that mountain to climb. But God, help us to know that you are with us in this and that you're gonna carry us through and you're gonna help us through. So God, I pray that as we study in this series about what it means to live in Christ likeness, would you help us to see within our own lives, within our own hearts, those areas that maybe we need to surrender over to you and those, those places that we can be more committed to live like you so that more people can find you, more people can be led to you and find a relationship with you, God. Lord, we thank you for Jesus and what he did for us on that cross and making it possible for us to live in Christ-likeness. So God, help us to strive to that. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Friends, I wanna encourage you that... Um, to first of all, be here and be a part of this series. If you can't be with us in, in, in person, come online and be a part of this as we strive to find ways for us to walk in Christ likeness. And I want to encourage you to maybe personally commit, I'm going to find some ways to be more like Jesus. And the thing is, is that when we do this, we're not walking this by ourselves. Christ, Jesus, he promises he'll be with us to the end. We're going to finish off this morning by singing a song about the fact that we can rest on that firm foundation, that he's never going to give up on us. He's never going to leave us alone. So as we sing this song, why don't we stand together? As we sing this song, make that commitment that I'm going to take another step towards Christ's likeness in my walk for him.
much for singing with us today. God bless you all. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you next week.